Islandas Sukas, welcome to the show. How are you this morning? I'm good, thank you very much, and thank you for having me, Elliot. You're more than welcome. Excited to dive into our topic of conversation today. But before we do, can you give those listeners a little bit of context about who you are, what it is that you do? Yeah, so my name is Islandas, and I am currently a mindset coach. So I work specifically with athletes, and I help them get over whatever kind of mindset hurdles they have so it can be anything from injury recovery some pe- some athletes struggle to really kind of get over the fact that they're injured and they can't work out they have to be stationary in some situations or post injury recovery um, lack of motivation lack of discipline any anything really that's preventing them from from achieve achieving peak performance in terms of their mindset and, and mentality and where they are with it got you and obviously, I've done my research on you beforehand. I understand that you were also a professional athlete in the past, if I'm not mistaken. Did you find those challenges yourself and that's what leads you to where you are today? Or what did your career as a professional freestyle wrestler, if I'm not mistaken, look like? Yeah, so my career is quite interesting. So I started my wrestling career when I was six years old, so quite a while ago now, I'm 31. So my parents kind of forced me to start wrestling. I did not like it, like it at all to begin with because oh, really? obviously that was taking away time from me to, to, to spend with my friends outside playing and, and, and stuff. So. I wasn't. I was not keen on, on on their decision. So yeah. So I started wrestling when I was six. I went and trained about five times a week. So it was a lot of time for me at the, at the time. It took me probably about five years to win at least a single fight. So it was definitely, definitely very discouraging, uh, especially for for somebody that's so young. And I felt I could have done so many other things. But yeah, it took me about five years to win a single fight, even though that was hitting my motivation and kind of kind of the the want to go and, and train and put the effort in. I was making friends, I was creating relationships. So it was kind of counteracting that not wanting to go and spend time in, in the gym. And after that, once I won my first fight, even though I didn't win the competition, it was my first fight that I won. I kind of felt that feeling of, of success, of achievement, and from there it just spiraled out of control, I guess. Uh, I kept winning more and more. I started going to training camps overseas to places like uh, Russia and Germany, Ukraine, uh, once in America as well. So I trained all over the place. I sparred with all kinds of people and from all kinds of places, won several international competitions. I've competed in Europe championships and world championships. So there was a lot of hurdles. <clears throat> there was a lot of hurdles when it comes to motivation. Obviously, as, as, as we're growing up, um, as we're kind of like young teenage years and trying to reach maturity in the, in the most sensible ways, you get, you get these kind of rebellious moments where You just don't want to do anything. Your your dedication goes away as well. Uh, Your discipline goes away. There were moments where I lost my confidence as well. Again, that first five years was definitely a a, a struggle. Loads of injuries. I had dislocated my knee, for example. That was a massive one. So I lost my confidence massively. But building that kind of athletic mindset throughout my career really helped me push through those moments and, and... helped me with my career after after wrestling so yeah and i want to go back to those five years obviously you were pretty young and at the same time you probably weren't super super aware like there would have been a big difference if you spent five years le- losing between the age of i don't know 16 and 21 versus five and 11 right there's a big difference between those two but did you not ever think like can i give up on this can i maybe try a different sport like five years for your first win seems like an incredibly long time for you to keep going and also for your family to keep pushing you in that direction. They must have had a lot of faith that it was going to pay off at some point. Yeah, so uh, wrestling kind of runs in my family. So my dad was a wrestler, not as successful, but he was a wrestler. And then his dad was also a wrestler. So it kind of ran in the family. And that was the reason why they forced me to do it. What helped is that my uncle was my coach. So even though my dad and my mom weren't there the majority of the time because my dad was either in jail most of the time because of his background and and gang violence and and all sorts of things. Um, And my my mom was working overseas to provide for us. So they weren't actually pushing me most of the time uh, because they weren't there. But my uncle was the one that kind of 
kept me there. So my parents got me there and my uncle kept me there. So he was the one that always took me to training. He was the one that always kind of prided me if I needed some like support, uh, mental support or kind of even food, money, whatever it was. Because it, it was tough times. It was really tough times because I was living with my nan so we didn't have much really at all. Um, so he really, really helped me pull through and then I developed, started developing relationships with my uh, fellow wrestlers there as well. So it, it kind of, even though my parents pushed me and maybe I wasn't really keen on going for the first, I'm going to say like a year, a year and a half maybe, uh, as a rough guess, my, my uncle really kind of held me there, really supported me and then once I started building those relationships and I started, started getting excited to see uh, all my friends there and my uncle and spend time with them. It was more kind of a, a relationship thing than really training, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah. And then obviously it paid off because you mentioned you went on to go to multiple training camps all around the world. You won a bunch of international competitions as well. Like you said, there were some struggles along the way, but there was also a lot of wins. What took you to the end of your professional wrestling career? Because of... I don't know what the age span of that is, but I can imagine most people wrestle into their late 20s, maybe? I have no idea. You can tell me more about that. In terms of the career span, it, it really depends on what kind of injuries you, you get, I guess. Um, so wrestling, obviously, is quite an intense sport. People oftentimes don't really realize how, how difficult it is and how much of a toll you get on your body from all the training because we, we deal with immense physical pressures really really difficult pressure so oftentimes uh, wrestlers have to end their careers because they simply cannot deal with, with injuries um, or some sort of repercussions because of injuries um, so that was the reason why I ended my career well part of the reason so when I was I think 18 I had my left knee dislocation so I popped my ACL my meniscus completely tore and I had a hyperextended PCL as well so it was really really bad injury what was annoying is because not well obviously injury is bad right that's annoying but uh, i was getting ready for uh the 2012 olympics uh, the london olympics and as i was in in the training camp in russia in kaliningrad that's when the injury happened and that was probably the most the most difficult thing about it because i was at, at, at the peak of my career i was doing really really well really achieving things and really dedicated, really confident, really motivated, really trying to achieve probably the peak of what I could have achieved as a, as a wrestler com competing in the Olympics. And obviously that injury really set me back. So I had to go to physical. First, I had to get a surgery uh, that, that lasted a couple of months, just getting everything sorted and, and getting the surgery done. And then the physical rehab took took about nine months, I think. So it it really set me behind quite a bit. And then, obviously, when I was nearing 19, that was around the time that I had to go to university because because Lithuania is not a very well recognized country when it comes to education. I decided to move abroad, which is why I ended up in England. England. So uh, I picked a university in England, and that kind of ended my wrestling career. I didn't really find any gyms nearby where I could go uh, train. Uh, so, yeah, it kind of ended there. And is there any regret that it ended there? Or do you think that the year you had to take off between your surgery and rehab would have set you back so much that maybe you wouldn't have gotten back to your best? Was there doubts? Do you think that, you know, given the opportunity today, if you could go back to being your 19-year-old self and you weren't moving to England, but you were going to continue with a wrestling career, you're not going to go down the route of education, do you think that you would have been able to? And is there a little bit of regret today? I guess maybe somewhat of a regret because I would have wanted to know what I could have achieved uh, in wrestling specifically because I was doing so well. However, the decisions that I made uh, got me to where I am today and I'm very, very happy with the situation that I am, I am in right now. So not, I wouldn't say it's a massive regret. Um, it definitely took me to a very interesting, interesting path. So uh, I, when I moved to England, I, I, that was the first time where I sensed freedom of, of kind of do what I want, when I want, how I want. So 
that freedom is a very a very dangerous thing for a young adult and it was definitely a very dangerous thing for me the intention when i moved was to go to university study economics uh, finish the university and obviously get a good job and i don't know banking or whatever it would have been that didn't go as planned so i did about six months in university and i dropped out because i got a job uh, a zero hour contract in a fast food chain restaurant and uh, I was like oh my god I'm getting all this money why should I go to education if I can get the money now so yeah I stopped going to university I dropped out I carried on working and then that led to meeting some I, I, I should say bad people I guess so I got into drugs I got into alcohol uh, it's it really really spiraled out of control so I had to I basically got to a very, very low point <clears throat> that made me realize what am I doing with my life? What did I do to lose this discipline that I had, this confidence, this motivation to achieve things? What, what went wrong? I, I have to rediscover this. I have to do something about it. So that's where I started delving into mindset and, and self, self-love and self-care and um, self-development self to really rediscover that athletic mindset that, that I had to really start pushing through life and, and achieving great things in my career. So that, that led to me becoming a chartered accountant. I, I started working as a head of finance in multiple businesses. I opened up my own accountancy practice and then I started looking into mindset coaching. So that's, that's what I'm really focusing on right now. I want to be able to teach people how to do these things that I've done that completely changed my life and allowed me to achieve success in, in many areas. It, it, it's a really liberating thing and I want people to, to be able to feel that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And what were some of those things that you did when you realized you were reaching this kind of dark point in your life? You knew that things couldn't continue this way. But at the same time, like when you're in that position, it's very easy to just kind of change things around overnight, right? You have the associations with that environment it's become your kind of new normal you probably didn't have that many people in england because you just moved over you still had that freedom so what things did you do that allowed you to get on the path to where you wanted to be yeah so one of the most important things that people don't don't really consider i guess is um having a really really well set out vision of what you want to achieve so that was probably the most important thing that I've done. So I, I wanted to do something that's going to change people's lives. So I, I thought that if I go into accountancy, I'll be able to do really good and provide people with jobs and provide wealth, um, just security for people, um, which was true. Um, I, I worked in businesses. I helped people sustain their lives because accountants are important. They're quite integral to businesses, right? But that wasn't that that wasn't specific enough when it came when it came to my vision i wanted to help more people right i wanted to really really make a difference hence why i moved into mindset coaching because uh, i feel like i make i can make a lot more difference to a lot more people that way however when it comes to setting up a vision you have to be careful because if you set it too specific it becomes a goal and goals are more short term I usually tend to say to people that the vision needs to be a slightly more vague. So like my vision, for example, changing people's lives, it's, it's specific enough, but it's vague enough as well. So that when I start helping people change their lives, I don't go in my head like, right, I'm, I'm, that's it. I achieved my vision. There's no finite destination for that helping people change their lives, right? It's vague enough to, to maintain it as a vision a grand goal of your life's purpose, right? Again, to achieve your vision, you need to set your goals. So I, I started setting smart goals, really specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and very time constrained. So I know spe exactly what I'm achieving, exactly what I need to do to, to, to get closer to that vision. Very, very kind of specific goal setting that allowed me to get closer to my uh, set vision. Um, then I took loads and loads of imperfect action. So it's, it's better to take loads of imperfect action very, very often than take no action because it's not perfect. You will achieve a lot more if you do a lot more, even though it's very little or it doesn't make much of a difference at the time you're doing it. So I did, I did take loads of action because of that and it allowed me to 
kind of set my mind straight towards where I want to go. Obviously there was loads of, loads of failures as well. I kind of learned to embrace those failures because when I started spiraling out of control when I moved to England, I didn't really think about failures as something that I need to really think about. I just thought, oh, this happened, that's not good. Oh well, I'll just carry on, right? I didn't really learn from these failures. So I started really embracing them and trying Try, so I try to learn from them as well to kind of implement those lessons and, and change things around going forward so I don't have to I don't have to ignore them as because they, they can be very li valuable life lessons right obviously relationship building that was a big thing uh, I had to kind of get rid of those people that were really pulling me down with them uh, I had to change my, my kind of relationships and and find the right kind of parties of people that I want to be surrounded by that really pull me to the other direction, pull me up, pull me towards motivation and that discipline. Um, so that was that was also a very, very big thing. And then I rediscovered how to embrace pressure. So we as athletes, we, we thrive in pressure, right? This The pressure is what we deal with every single day because as professional athletes, we, we train pretty much every single day. I used to train six six days a week. We learned to thrive in this pressure, and I forgot how to do it because there was no pressure. It was complete freedom and complete, I don't know, free-for-all. I could do whatever I want, whenever I want, want. So I lost that that ability to thrive in pressure, so I had to rediscover it. And yeah, I, I read loads of books. I did loads of research on how to do those things and, and how to set proper goals and how to look after my mindset and, and, and mentality and how to reinstill that motivation and discipline and confidence. So yeah, and those are those are just a few a few things. There's other things like diet and rest that's very important and physical consistency as well. You have to maintain your physicality because if your mind's happy, your physicality is happy. If if your body is happy, then your mind's happy as well. So they work in tandem. So yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there, and I think it was all about taking multiple different steps. I don't think I hear anything that completely moved the needle forward. It was a little bit of everything, right? Like you had to start with that vision. I think that that put you on the map to begin with. So you knew, okay, I don't necessarily need a set point in which I'm going, but I need a direction. And the vision provided that direction. And then the goals were those checkpoints. Then you're like, okay, at least I know I'm traveling towards something. Then I move on to the next one and the next one and the next one, etc. And then everything that came thereafter just kind of supported that vision, you know, getting the people out of your life, crafting your environment, remembering some of the things that you utilized as an athlete, taking imperfect action and also being okay with that as well. Because I can imagine maybe sometimes when you were going through that, maybe those five years where you never won a fight came back to your mind, right? And if you were thinking, well, you know, it took me five years to see any relative success. Of course, maybe I saw progress, but in terms of like a tangible win to hold on to, I didn't see that for five years. Then it kind of gives you this ability to maybe go through those challenges, knowing that eventually if I keep putting in the work like I did with the wrestling, at some point this has to pay off, right? Yeah, I mean... To be honest, at that point, imperfect action was almost as close as it could get to perfect action for me because I was taking no action whatsoever. I had no concept of, w of what perfect should be. So I just took action. I just decided that I have to do something about my life because I will achieve nothing. I will amount to nothing. So I just took action. That was the most important thing to do. I didn't really think about if it's perfect or not. Now that I look back to it, then yeah, it was definitely imperfect action because it was very minor steps. There was loads of mistakes, uh, loads of things that I could have done better to get to where I am much faster. But that's what allowed me to learn all these techniques and, and tools that I, I teach other people now. This is what allowed me to develop the ability to, to allow people to uh, embrace their mindset and apply their athletic mindset and, and develop in their careers outside of sport or or kind of accelerate their sports forwards to achieve success and, and peak performance. So Yeah, absolutely. So that says a lot about your story. And now I want to transition on to some of the athletes that you work with as well. What is the difference between the principles that you apply to 
obviously go to being a chartered accountant first, opening up your accountancy and then transitioning to the mindset coaching versus some of the challenges that athletes come to you with. You know, I can imagine there's a lot, like you said, in regards to injury, in regards to losses, knocks in confidence, et cetera. So how do you go about di like diagnosing a challenge that an athlete might have or even bolstering an already existing strong mindset? Because I imagine it needs to be as strong as possible in order to, for them to get the success that they're after, right? Those margins at the very top of the game are very, very fine. So I can imagine it's not just about problem solving, but it's also about like optimizing, bolstering, and ensuring that everything they do is aligned to the vision that they have. Yeah, so the way the way I usually a approach these kind of problems that, that people come, come to me with when it, come, when it comes to mindset, so I really try and segment it uh, first of all, to pinpoint where it comes from. So I do something that's called wheel of life and it really, really kind of segments their life in, in different areas. Uh, it can be health, it can be money, it can be related to relationships, it can be related to leisure, personal growth, whatever it is, it can be completely different from person to person. There's, there's a standard kind of approach how you can do it and there's there's a very uh, person specific approach that you, that you that you can use as well so that really allows me to pinpoint which area that issue is coming from if there are any correlations correlations between different parts and then from there we usually kind of try and I, I, I tend to say peel the layers of the onion by me asking questions very very specific questions to that person to kind of figure out where that underlying issue is and what it is at the very, very core of that onion, I guess. And it really, really depends on, on the issue. And there's so many, so many different things that can be causing problems uh, for people. So I had one, one client that was really, really struggling uh, to kind of deal with um, success in their career. Uh, and they had kind of, kind of a con conflicting situation. So they, they wanted to achieve really really high levels in wrestling but they also wanted to be a wrestling coach and the more i dug deeper the more i found out that surprisingly it related to them thinking that money is evil they just had this really deep feeling that money is the root of all evil so that prevented them from really trying to become a, a wrestling coach because they didn't think that they were supposed to take money from people to teach people wrestling and because of that, that was stagnating their growth in wrestling because they didn't, they didn't put 100% into training. They didn't put 100% into develop, develop, developing themselves as a, as a wrestler. So conversely, if you're not growing as a wrestler, how are you going to teach people to become a, a wrestler, right? So it, there's, yeah, there's some really, really odd kind of situations. Like you, you would not expect money to be something that prevents a person from becoming a better wrestler or thinking that money is a root of all evil and then you you just cannot train because of that it's just really really odd situations um, i mean i had another client that could not <clears throat> just could not set a routine in place every single time they start setting a routine in, into place they they go into this chaotic spiral and they really focus on one thing and that thing just spirals out of control and they lose control of it and they get overwhelmed and they drop everything and they go back into into kind of this really lazy state uh, they, they cannot cannot achieve anything so fixing something like that was as simple as making the person really mentally visualize what a person with a very solid routine would look like what how would they talk how would what would their posture be how would they see things what's the environment around them how they dress how they talk how they breathe how just everything about it and making them remember what it felt like and to be in that vision really helped them kind of set a routine in place started starting with small steps uh, we started with just simply watering plants every single time they wake up because it's routine you have to do it every morning um, then it went to journaling writing down stuff like what do they do that's consistent from day to day and doing that every single day so that adds more consistency they're kind of reinforcing that consistency by writing about it then they did something that i didn't ask them to do but they tattooed a pause 
uh, button kind of symbol on their thumb. So every single time they start doom scrolling on Instagram, they see that tattoo and they're like, oh my God, what am I doing? I need to do something productive. So you can get all kinds of interesting situations and, and everybody's unique. There's no one set way of approaching a situation because there can be some really, really unusual underlying reasons why they are behaving the way they're behaving, why they're having this issue with their mindset. It's, it can be very, very different, very unique from person to person. Yeah, absolutely. I want to unpack both of those and we'll start with the second one in regards to not being able to set a routine. Did they need to create that vision of a person who was consistent, who was able to follow the routine, how they would carry themselves, how they would dress, breathe, live, essentially, because they never had an example of that? Did they almost need to see something in practice in real life in order to be able to create that? And was that like an element of visualization to a degree? What was the purpose of having that type of person and then being able to kind of follow in their footsteps? Because I imagine it wasn't necessarily a real person. It was just kind of a figment of the imagination with what they maybe saw and the people they aspired to and maybe just taking like little pieces of those. Surprisingly, what, what, what we see and what we remember, what we think about is very, very subconscious. There's usually, the way I kind of segment things is, is we have two brains. We have a chimp brain, which is a very primordial kind of fast to react brain. Uh, it's more to do with like fear and, and quick rewards, like um, something that, I, I don't know, like going on social media and having like a chocolate, that's a very, very fast dopamine reward. And then we have a professor brain that really takes time to really analyze everything and put everything into perspective. But the problem is usually all these experiences that we have, for example, she had a situation where she had a routine before. That's why the, that's what the visualization brought back, but it was stuck in her professor brain. So the chimp was fast to react to bring back different things that were not relevant. That's why I peel those layers of the onion to get really deep into what it is that's causing issues. So the visualization is something that athletes do as well. We tend to kind of before competitions, I used to do it anyway, and I know quite a few people that used to do uh, this visualization. It's called neuro-linguistic programming. So you go into your head and try to visualize the competition and try to visualize as many situations you can, how things can play out, how I might take down a person if it's wrestling, how I might defend if somebody takes me down. And it creates faster reactions, faster respo responses to certain situations when, when it comes to it. That's what I tried to do with her, for example. I got her to visualize a very, very specific scenario, which in, in that case was um, her being in an environment uh, that gave her the feeling of having a routine uh, something that she, that she could follow and that actually brought back a very very specific moment in her life for her and surprisingly it was a big thing for her uh, because she worked she was working in NHS and that was during the COVID time as well uh, she's she, NHS is, is basically the UK kind of healthcare system and she d didn't really think about it she never had a thought of going back to that time to remember what she had to kind of build uh, what she had at that time to be able to have that routine. But that visualization really made her jump straight back into that moment. She really vividly remembered the exact moment where she was walking through the NHS corridor, all the stuff happening around her, how she talked, how she felt, what was exactly about the routine that she needed to do to pull back from that moment to be able to, to, to develop a routine outside of that specific scenario in, in the present, right? So it really, really helped her bring back that specific moment where she was really thriving and had a really, really strong routine. Amazing. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And is an element of the visualizing, kind of like you mentioned, when you're going into a wrestling match and you are thinking about how you're going to take someone down, how you're going to defend if you're taken down, is part of the reason why the reactions are faster is because you've almost at least your mind believes that you've already lived that so you already kind of are nearly fired in a way to 
respond to that. Your body's just lacking the movement more so than anything, but visually and mentally, it's already lived that moment. So that's what makes it effective. Yeah, so it is actually surprisingly, surprisingly effective. So um, I used to do that visualization pretty much every single time uh, before a competition. Uh, and I really, really tried to kind of visualize what kind of situations I could get into and what could happen and how I would deal with them. That was partly because it helps, but partly because my brain just goes. If I have, if I have an event coming up, I just cannot stop thinking about it. I just constantly think, think it over and over and over again to make sure that uh, I kind of, I am as prepared as I can be. There's also an interesting study that has been done with athletes. I think it was body uh, bodybuilders. They compared muscle growth for bodybuilders where within a given period of time, they would lift weights, uh, like heavy weights for them at, at, at whatever they physical say they are. And then they visualize lifting weights. And as they visualize lifting weights, it's not as a significant muscle growth as they would get from lifting weights, but they actually saw muscle growth. So your brain is an immensely powerful tool. The brain co controls everything. It connects everything in your body. So it makes sense that it can promote gr mus muscle growth, even if you're not working out. But uh, obviously it's not, it's not as, as good as it would be if you actually do the exercise, but it just shows the strength of visualization and how, how important it can be to kind of growing as a person and physically and mentally so yeah absolutely and all these big achievements and feats they require discipline they require you to keep showing up and keep doing the things on a day-to-day -day basis how important is discipline with the people that you work with and how you go about your day-to-day -day life now to achieve the goals that you're after yeah so discipline i actually had a poll recently on, on my social media and it's not just me that that agrees with it but 70% of people that voted agree that discipline is one of the most important things for for athletes to be able to be successful so I mean it's it's huge it's really really important I, I usually I usually segment kind of the the athletic mindset into three areas so motivation uh, discipline and confidence and discipline is without a doubt a very very important thing so and it really really stems from developing motivation so if you do things like consistent action taking and if you constantly achieve your goals um, and you look after yourself mentally and physically, you create good habits, then inherently that will build motivation. But as, as you get more motivated, conversely, that builds your discipline, right? It, 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 it just follows suit, right? Uh, the, the more motivated you are, the more you will have discipline because the more success you will see in, in, in your career as, as an athlete. Um, and it just, it doesn't apply just, just to being an athlete. It applies to anything, really. Uh, the more you do something, the more you achieve something, the more discipline you will have because you see success in whatever you are doing. And when it comes to discipline as well, the, it's quite important to... Um, really look at your goals. That's that's something that I, I, I tell my clients as well. So uh, when you start building up your motivation, I guess, your goals shouldn't be too difficult, I guess I could say. Um, because if you set your goals in, incorrectly, if they're too difficult to achieve, you won't be able to achieve, to build that motivation to really kind of push you forward and make you grow more and more. But when it comes to discipline, you already have that motivation to, to be able to build on the discipline. So when it comes to discipline, you want to push yourself more. You want to maintain the growth of, of, of that discipline. And we, we thrive in challenges. We are built to withstand challenges. Challenges are something that make us stronger in, in whatever the situation is that is actually challenging us. So goals should be quite challenging at, at that point if you want to develop that discipline and, and, and build it. And um, that's something that I found out myself as well uh, while, when I was kind of being reborn from the ashes, I guess. Um, just setting goals in, in a very, very specific way and then and making them more challenging as time goes. So I push myself more. I force myself to push myself uh, more and more with very specific goal setting. And then very important to not beat yourself up over setbacks because there will be setbacks 
if you beat yourself up over setbacks, then discipline is going to go out of the window. You, you, you need to be disciplined um, and you need, to, you need to do things consistent, consistently. Uh, and if you start beating yourself o up over failures and setbacks, then you will stop doing things consistently. And that's not going to get you anywhere. It's definitely not going to maintain your discipline. No, absolutely. And in regards to the um, discipline and motivation piece, and you mentioned that they kind of fall hand in hand, what about when people reach a comfort zone? They start to become complacent because they have these big visions and they have these big goals, but they actually feel pretty good with where they are. Maybe they get a ton of money because of they are performing in the sport that they are and they get carried away with that. They're not thinking about the bigger vision of what they wanted to be, but they get caught up with the money, the success, whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden they start taking it a little bit easier. You hear about people going a little bit soft compared to when their life was much harder, they were able to work incredibly hard and stay disciplined. But all of a sudden these things come into their lives, which make things a little bit easier on a day-to-day -day basis what happens there with the motivation and the discipline? Because I imagine both of those things are still the same to a degree, but now there's other variables to consider, which is comfort, complacency, ease of life, etc. So how do you unpack that? I guess it really depends on what the vision was for the person. So if the person is getting complacent, uh, if the person is getting comfortable with the situation, presumably they would have achieved whatever division the they set so there's either an issue with the vision that they set or there's they simply achieve the vision that they set out to achieve which is fine people have different visions right if they achieve it and they are happy with the with the situation that they're in they are comfortable with the situation that they're in that's great the, the comfort is fine because you achieve your vision that's completely fine complacency however that is not good regardless if you achieve vision your vision or not because complacency can backtrack you to where you started complacency is something that i had to deal with that's something that spiraled me out of control Get, getting comfortable and complacent and and just having that freedom to do what i want um, that really really pushed me the other the, the other dire direction so when it comes to uh, complacency uh, you really really need to realize that you're complacent first of all a lot of the times people don't actually re even realize that they're being complacent they just realize the fact that they're comfortable and that they achieve the, the, the vision that they set out that's it uh, so they they are happy to stay where they are complacency is gonna be apparent because you will notice that you're not feeling the success that you have felt even though you achieve your vision you're still feeling that success hopefully you're still feeling that success of, of actually being where you are, but complacency takes that feeling of, of, of success back away from you. And once you start feeling that the, su the success is not there, that's where you want to really reevaluate your vision. Um, you really want to reevaluate your goal setting. It's really beneficial to also, also get or build some sort of accountability so it can't be anything like... Uh, just asking somebody to really kick you up, up your behind if you're not doing the things that you need to do. Maybe be accountable to yourself. So write down some something on on a post-it note or or on a calendar that you have to achieve. And if you don't achieve, then I don't know. You don't you don't go to the movies because you go to the movies every week. So you don't just don't go to the movies. Some, something along those lines. Um, something that's not punishing you, but something that doesn't give you that dopamine hit if you don't actually stay consistent and try to achieve success and it's really really reevaluating your your situation it's it's really it's really difficult to acknowledge the fact that you are being complacent because people don't really realize that because they get stuck in that comfort they get absorbed by the comfort and they don't really want to move anywhere from there and it's good it, it's it's good if you don't lose if, if you don't start getting complacent if you start getting complacent then it starts pulling you back backtracking you and and you really need to evaluate that but it's going to be difficult to do it if you don't realize it yourself yeah absolutely and how does confidence tie in you mentioned discipline motivation and confidence how does that tie into the equation of success when it comes to your mindset yeah so confidence is probably the the last step that we build as part of as part of a mindset so you develop your motivation uh, that discipline follows from motivation 
Um, and the more discipline you build, the more success you, success you get, the more confidence you get. Um, the com confidence is the most, I think, is the most important thing and, the, well, the, the strongest driver of, of you achieving something. Because um, the more confident you are, the more, the more action you will take, uh, the further the further you will push yourself, the, the bigger the goals you will, you will set. The more you will, you will want and the more you want, the, again, the bigger the goals. It's just, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, whatever, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. If you build confidence in one area of your life, for example, I build confidence in, in, in wrestling and in, in sport, that, that allowed me to have confidence in everyday life as well, like uh, in terms of achieving success in, in accountancy, I was really, really confident that I can do it because I, I achieved success throughout 14, 15 years of my wrestling career. That's a, a huge amount of time and I was confident in myself that within two, three, four years I will s achieve success in, in, in accountancy because comparatively, those four, three years compared to 14, 15 years of wrestling is a very, very short amount of time. I managed to deal with over a decade of pressure. Surely I will manage to deal with a couple of years of pressure now to be able to achieve success in a different area. So confidence is very, very important. Confidence is not something that people have these days as well. And that is partially because of social media, uh, because you see all these people being successful. You compare yourself. Comparison is a very, very big thing as well. You compare yourself to other people and you cannot help but think, why am I not in, in Bali right now, sitting in front of a beach drinking, a, a, I don't know, mock, I don't know, I don't even know, I don't drink alcohol, but <laughs> drink some sort of a <laughs> cocktail. Um, a margarita or something. Oh, margarita, yeah, something like that. Why am I not this person enjoying success and, and happiness? If you compare yourself, again, it's, it's, it's not something that's going to give you confidence. If you compare yourself correctly, though, if you compare yourself, again, to the same person that's sitting at, at, at a beach uh, drinking some sort of a cocktail, then you could, you could compare yourself and think, right, so what? That person is really successful. So what is that person doing that I'm not doing? I need to try and figure out what that person is doing right because there's clearly something that I'm not doing that I could do to be able to be in the same situation that they are. So yeah, comparison is also very important when it comes to confidence, but confidence, it, it takes time to build confidence, I think. And it, again, it depends from person to person. There's different ways you, you can approach those three pillars, but confidence is definitely, uh, from my experience anyway, is probably the last, per the last thing that people build as, as they build their, their mindset. Yeah, but it's a good point because of any successful athlete that you see, they always will carry confidence. It might be a quiet, humble confidence that you might see in someone like Messi, for example, or Roger Federer, for example. And then you see kind of the arrogant, uh, egotistical side of things. And you think of someone like Conor McGregor, for example, maybe a little bit of Cristiano Ronaldo, but they all have that confidence. It's just how they carry it is just looks a little bit different but at the end of the day you know that that's a confident individual irrespective of how they carry it because it shows up in everything they do the way they play the way they perform and i think that yeah it's a major key there's not many people who you see who are successful especially for long periods of time or who are at the very very top level who don't have confidence it's almost impossible not to see absolutely yeah and and like you said good examples like conor mcgregor and Cristiano Ronaldo or, or Messi, that they, they are confident people. You perceive the competent confidence in different ways, but they are very, very successful because they have that confidence to really, really push themselves and really, really set themselves apart from, from the competition. It's really, really key. It's really, really important to be successful, not just in sport, but everywhere, everywhere in life. Confidence is really, really key. Absolutely. And Islanders, what impact do you want to have on the world with the work that you do? Oh, that is, that is a big question. Um, I want to have as big of an impact as I can. I just want people to really, really feel the change that you can have in yourself when you really develop a really, really solid mindset. If you really work on the three pound lump of fat in your head, and really make it tick, um, you, will, you will change everything. This thing controls your whole body. 
So if you can you, if you can work on your mindset, I, I can I can promise you that everything is gonna fall into into place. And people don't really know about mindset coaching that well because it's not it's not it's it has a sort of a negative kind of correlation to it because there's no you don't really get a very fast kind of you don't really get fast benefits from it. The, the, usually the way it works if, is you plant, I plant seeds in my, in my customers' heads, right? So we might have a session and they don't get out of, anything out of it. They feel like, they, like they, they didn't get anything out of it. But the next week we have a session, very often they say to me, oh, I was really thinking about this. or I was really thinking about that, that, you, that we talked about last week. And you can see how their faces light up because they really thought about it and they, it's changing their perspective for, for the better. They're getting closer to their vision, their goals. It's just really, really re rewarding. And especially these days when social media, and like, like I said, comparing yourself to um, successful people on social media, everyone's really kind of like depression is skyrocketing, anxiety is skyrocketing right now all these mental illnesses and it's really really important to help as many people as possible it should be our calling as as a species we are we are a species as that thrives and as a collective right we don't we don't really do well on our own by ourselves right we thrive as a collective we thrive when we communicate when we work together and building the mindset uh, of of an athlete uh, first of all, helps you achieve success in a sport, in, in, in a sport that you choose or in your career. And then it allows me to help a multitude of people, be it a one-on-one -on -one session or a group coaching session. It's just helping people understand the power of the mindset and really help them change their lives for the better. It can be a really, really liberating thing, both for me and the people that, that I can help. So the more people I can help, the the better I will feel, um, the more things I can do. One of the biggest dreams that I have is to open up a, a resort specifically for mindset uh, retreats and helping people develop the mindset through be it meditation, through yoga, through mindset coaching, all these things and just helping people cultivate that mindset and, and mindfulness to be fair. Mindfulness is also very important. So yeah, it's really, really important for me. Yeah, it seems like you've got your vision very, very clear indeed, which is fantastic. And where is the best place for people to find you if they want to keep up with the work that you're doing? Best place to find me would be Instagram. So it's Ilanda Solkas on Instagram. And then my website has really good free resources as well, which is www.ilandasolkas.com. Um, you can check me out there as well. Um, my whole life story is there. I have my free ebook there. I really explain what coaching is. So yeah, if you check out my Instagram and my website, you should get a really good understanding of what I do and uh, keep keep in touch with me and uh, keep up to date with what I do. Amazing. I learned this. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Elliot. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and, and hopefully to loads of people and, and your audience.